<laughs> Become baby sad. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. We're going to talk today about the New Jerusalem. When I was just meditating and praying about what to speak on, a, a song that Ruth Ward Heflin sings came to my mind. And it's about Jerusalem, but we now know it's not just about Jerusalem, the natural city. Right. It's Jerusalem, the heavenly city. And we now know, as Kelly Bonner says, you are the Jew. There's no more Jew, there's no more Greek, there's no more separation between us. We're all one. We're one family, one faith, one Lord. And hallelujah, we now know it. We didn't always know it. We used to think that they had something special we didn't have. They came through another way that we didn't get to come through. But now we know that what the Lord always said, that he wasn't a respecter of their persons. Amen. That it was always for us all. Hallelujah. 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 And uh, I want to read a little bit out of Revelation chapter 21. And then I'm going to go back into Hebrews chapter 12. So I'll give you a minute to get there. But um, Revelation chapter 21 is where John saw the, the city. And he tells you a little bit about it, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what it was before we talk about entering into it. Because you won't know if you've entered in if you don't know what it is. And verse 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. Hallelujah. We're all looking for the day where there's no more sea, no more rockiness, no more ups and downs, no more storming. No more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Hallelujah. And I wanted to go down to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal, and had a, great, a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And I wanted to read that part because I wanted to emphasize that, that we have a great foundation and great walls around our city yeah. and 12 gates. And it's not just a, um, a weak city, but it's a strong city. So I wanted yeah. to emphasize that. But I wanted to go back into Hebrews chapter 12 because we were told about that city growing up. But it might as well have been, I thought about this morning, we might as well have been Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, and it might as well have been somewhere over the rainbow, because that's all that we were ever told. Someday, somewhere, it'll happen. But we don't know when and we don't know where, and maybe when we die we might get there, depending on what philosophy you listen to. You might get there when you die. You might have to wait for the Lord to come back and set it up here. But at any rate, you weren't in it right now. No matter which way you sliced it, you were still waiting for that day over the rainbow. But Paul doesn't say that in Hebrews chapter 12. And I read the, if I read this whole chapter, we'll be well beyond an hour. So I'll try to get down to where we need to be because this chapter is just about 20 sermons in itself. And it has lots of good stuff in it. But before we, he gets there, in, in the first part of it, he talks about being, you know, in chapter 11, he talks about the people of faith. And he talks about, when he starts chapter 12, he says, so now seeing that we're compassed about with them, we're compassed about with so great a God's witness. So this city isn't just your city. And it's not just 
us that you can see, but it's a city filled with people you can't see right now. Yeah. They're with us. They're here, even if we can't see them. And then he tells us to lay aside all the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us because there is no sin in this city. There is no weight in this city. We just read in John, there's no darkness. There's no death. There's no any of those things there. And if we're experiencing that, it's just because we're not really truly believing we're in the city. Because when you're in the city, none of those things are there. And then we come down to, and it's, he talks about how a father chastens his son, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing to learn the Lord, not to, not to take it the wrong way, that you want to learn of him. You want to grow in him. And then we come down, let me see where I want to start. In, in verse 18, it said, For you are not come unto the mount that might not be touched, or might be touched, and that burn with fire, and the blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard and treated the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned and thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Yeah. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So we've come to the city, the heavenly Jerusalem. We're not waiting to come. We came. The minute you got born again, you became a citizen of New Jerusalem. You may not have known it. You may have had a lot of people that put different coverings over you that didn't look like New Jerusalem. It didn't look like it was a new heaven and a new earth, but all the time it was. You just didn't know it yet. Um, you know, if, you, if you've ever been out of state, when you cross the line, if you don't see that sign that says you cross the line, you won't know it. Right. It looks the same. Land's still the same. Things look the same, but you cross the line. Now, if you keep driving and you keep touring that state, you'll find out you're in a different state. Because if you go from Florida to Georgia, eventually you're going to hit some mountains and find out you're not in Florida anymore. If you cross the line and go from Georgia down to Florida, you'll keep driving and somewhere you're going to hit some palm trees and some oceans and you'll find out you're not in Georgia anymore. Mm -hmm. The scenery's changed. Problem is, a lot of us don't go out and explore the kingdom. So we don't know we're in a new kingdom because we haven't explored the things of the kingdom. Miles Monroe told a story, and whether or not it was true or just an example, I don't know, but he told a story about an elderly couple that somehow won a trip on a cruise. So they went and took their trip on the cruise, and when they got back, everybody wanted to know, how was the cruise? And they told them how wonderful it was, and they told them all about their cabin where they slept. And they said, well, that's great, but how was the pool, and how was the buffet, and all the other things on the ship? And they said, oh, we never left the cabin. And the question was, why not? Well, we just want a ticket to get into our cabin. They showed us to our cabin, and we stayed there. And a lot of people in Christianity do that. They get their salvation, they sit right there, and they stay there. They don't learn anything more of the kingdom. They don't go explore where they are at. If they're there, they have free access to the entire ship, but they don't explore it. They don't know. And a lot of times they don't know because, like I said, there's a covering over you. You have to make the separation between the covering that... Religion is placed on you. People are placed on you. You might have heard someone say something and you placed it on yourself. But you have to make the separation because when God made you, He didn't make anything wrong. He made you just like Him. He made you perfect for walking in this kingdom and exploring it. He made you to live in it. But people just put coverings over us and we believe the covering. That's all it is. We believe the covering. It's like... When you see a little kid on Halloween and someone comes up dressed up as a scary witch and they believe it's a witch. They don't know that underneath is a, is a real person. They think something scary is actually coming after them. And it's the same way. We believe it and therefore we live like it is. We believe it. We believe from the moment that we're, we're like Matt says, even before we're born, the covering of disease is put upon us. Yeah. They start to look for disease. When we go, you know, we, of course our mindset is different. When I go for the first time and they get, you know, you hit a certain stage, I think it's around three or four months, they get to hear the heartbeat. Well, I love to hear the heartbeat because to me that's life. 
But they're not. The doctors aren't listening to that heartbeat to hear that. They're listening to that heartbeat to make sure there's one to make sure that the baby's not dead. They're listening to it to make sure that they don't hear a defect in there. When you go for the sonogram, I love doing the sonogram. I get to. I like knowing if it's a boy or a girl. Some people want to be surprised. I want to have everything ready. If it's a girl, I want everything pink, and if it's a boy, I want all the blue stuff I can get. That's just me. But the doctors aren't doing that sonogram to tell me if it's a boy or a girl. They're doing it to find out if there's anything wrong with the baby, because that's what they expect. That's what they're looking for. And then the baby's born, and they do the exact same thing. And not only do they do it, but, you know, and all of us are guilty, so we'll all raise our hands that we do it. Somebody gets sick, stay away from the baby. You might make the baby sick. Then the baby gets sick. See, I told you. I told you to stay away from the baby. <laughs> we accept that covering, and then when we see it manifest, we want to act like, you know, the God, God or the devil did, or, you know, it's one of those religious reasons. But the honest truth is we accepted the covering, we took it on, we took it on as a part of us, instead of just, you know, you can change your clothes. You don't have to keep those coverings. You have every right to get up and, turn, and take them off and put on a new set of clothes and put on the Word of God and put on all those things. I don't know if you've seen it. There's this commercial on TV that was out a few months ago. And there was a man, and he was um, like, if you ever seen like a surfer guy, just kind of in raggedy clothes. His hair was long and not combed out or really anything. And they take him, and they give him a nice clean cut haircut, shave his face, put a nice brand new suit on him, kind of give him some words to say, and he goes in for these interviews with these people to be their financial planner. And at the end of it, he says, you know, well, do you feel okay with me being your financial planner? Oh, yes. Yes, we do. And then they reveal that he knows nothing about financial planning at all. It was just the covering they were looking at that convinced them he must know what he's talking about. Because he looks nice, and he's dressed nice, and he says a few flashy words, so he must know what he's talking about. But that really wasn't who he was. It was just a covering somebody put on him. And that's us. Just because you see it. See, a Western society, to us, experience is as good as another God to us. If we hear somebody else experienced it, we believe it's true. So if someone else died, then people die. If someone else got in a car accident, then we better pray because we don't want to get in an accident. If someone else experiences cancer, then cancer must be real. It must be something that's, that we have to experience. Experience is like a God to us. If we see it, we believe it must be real for us too. Not just that person, but real for us too. And the reality is that we have to take off the covering, not just on us, but we have to take the covering off of others. Because sickness won't, the, what we're looking for, that manifested healing where we all walk in divine healing, it won't work until we not only don't see it in us, but we've got to not see it in others. Oh, yeah. It's the same with salvation. Someone's not going to get saved if you say what a rotten sinner they are all the time. Right. If all you see is a drug addict, that's all you'll ever see, right. unless someone else comes off and pulls off the covering. Oh, yeah. Because as long as you see it, and they see it, and everybody's just seeing it, and we're just all calling it what it is, like we say all the time, then it's just going to remain that. It's going to remain it. If all you see is a prostitute when you see her on the side of the street, and you don't see a child of God, then she, you can't bring life to her. If all you see her as is death, then you can't bring life, because all you see is death. You can't bring healing to a situation that you don't see healing in. If all you see is, like we said about Jesus, he's told the man to stretch forth his hand, not his withered hand. He had to see it as not withered first. If all you see is the death and the withering and all those things, then that's what's going to manifest. You can't manifest something different from what you believe. That's what faith is. You've got to believe it. And it's not that hard, you know. Um, it's just a matter of receiving. You don't, the Bible never says you have to work for it. You know, I, I thought about this morning. Faith pleases God. The Bible says that. But faith doesn't move God. Faith moves mountains. And for so long in Pentecost, we thought we had to move God. We thought we had to change the mind of God because He might not be on our side. He may not want what we want. And we think we're going to change Him. That's, that's why we speak against doing things just to change God. We speak against fasting because you think you're going to change God's mind. Now, if you fast because you need to fast, because your mind needs to change, and that's fine. I have fa you know when I know it's time to fast, when my emotions and my mind are screaming so loud at me that I can't hear the voice of the Lord, I say, oh, it's time to go on a fast. It's time to remind my emotions and my flesh that they do not rule 
in my house. They don't rule in my city. There's one light in the city, and that's Jesus, and that's it. So that's the time of going to fast. But I don't go on fast to change God's mind. I don't confess to change God's mind. And for so long, we were taught it was like hocus pocus magic. Man, you just had to fast, pray, confess, seven steps to this, 20 steps to that. If you give me $30, you'll receive $30,000 in return. If you so, you know, the Lord says so $35.12 because he gave me some scripture in the Bible that was 35 12 you know, it's all this hocus pocus. If you do this, you get this. It's like a magic trick. You know, you might as well just, you know, jump around in the circles 12 times and repeat something. Because that's how they, it was made out to be. And then when we did it and it didn't happen, discouragement. You think your faith didn't work. You didn't know all along that wasn't faith. That wasn't what pleased God. Because what pleasing God is having the faith of God. That's just believing what he believes. That's it. That's why I said it's only about receiving. It's not about you doing something to get there. If you receive it, he'll start speaking to you and showing you every single step along the way. But you have to receive it first. That's all you have to do. That's why people, you know, um, we just read that you didn't, we didn't come to a mountain that you could touch, that could be touched. We, Mount Zion is not like that. The New Jerusalem, the kingdom of God, which is the New Jerusalem, if you want to know, they're one of the same. A lot of times when I was in Bible school, they said the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God were two different things. That's not true. How are you going to say it? They're just confused. The same way they separate the kingdom, it's the same way they separate God. Yeah. And they make him free people. Yeah. Even though he said, behold, Israel, your Lord, your God is one God. Yeah. They make him free people. Then they make two different kingdoms, one for here and one for heaven. Right. Then they make us not one with God. Even though Jesus said, Father and I are one, we're going to come and take up our vote in you. We want to be one with you. And not only that, we want you to be one with everybody yeah. around you, right. just like we're one. They're, because everything with them is duality. We're over here and God's over there. Right. We're over here. That's why you have denominations. We're over here and you're over there. Right. We're not a part of this. Everything has to be divided up to them. That's not what the Word says. The Word says we're one. So if you, when I start telling you about the New Jerusalem, I'm not talking about something outside the kingdom that you already have right now. The New Jerusalem is the kingdom. We are the city. Yeah. Jesus said we were, and you know what they said about that too? They did the same thing. They said that that city was somehow different from the New Jerusalem city. And that's why we had to wait on it. But if you want to know why we haven't drawn men, it's because since we don't believe it, our city set on the hill looks just like the world city. And if we look just like them, why would they want to come to where we are? You know why people wanted to come to America when it was first? And they still want to come. Because it was different from where they were. Because there, there was more opportunity. There they had a democratic government that would let you do more. So they wanted to come. They wanted something different from what they were under. Had America just set up the same old, old kingdom government where people couldn't work and do what they wanted to do, nobody would have wanted to come. It would be the same old place. But when people start to see something different out of the church and we start to be a city that looks like the New Jerusalem, then they want to come. Because then there's no sorrow and there's no death and there's no pain and there's no tears and there's no all those things that are, we see that are outside of the kingdom. But if the church has all that living in it right now, there's no, there's no reason to move to another city that's just like your city. There's just no reason to do it. There's no reason to move to a new place if it's just like where you came from. Yeah. So we want to start partaking of this new city. And we want to see that manifest. And I know that we await the manifestation, but sometimes we wait and we wait and we wait and we wait. And the reality is we've never received that it really could happen to us. We just received that maybe it could happen, somebody, somewhere. Right. You know, growing up, I remember, and they never said it, so it's not, it's not saying they ever said this. But I remember, you know, thinking because of the way religion had taught us, I mean, how could you get healed if you didn't have a healing anointing on you like the pastor did? You had to call the pastor. There was no other way. Because religion had taught you, if you didn't have that special anointing, it wasn't going to work for you. That's right. How could you have faith for anything like Kenneth Hagin did? He had special faith. Yeah. And that wasn't him saying that. That was religion telling you that. Well, he's special. He's different. You know, how could you ever be financially free like the Copeland taught? They had special faith for that. We just didn't have the same kind of faith that they did. That was what religion said. And that's not true. 
God is the same to all men. He's the same. His mercy covers all. In fact, he's so good that he said, I ran on the just and I ran on the unjust. Yeah, that's right. Amen. He's so good that he said, it doesn't even matter to me. It matters to you. You look at a person and you treat them based on what they do and who they are. And I'm not saying you specifically, but a lot of people do, right? You, they, they look at somebody and they treat them totally based on what they see with their eyes. Yeah. But God's not like that. He's not like that at all. When Samuel came and he looked at all of Jesse's sons, he thought, surely the Lord's anointed. Because they were big and they were strong and they were all these things that Saul had been. All these things that outward men had been. And he thought, this must be it. And God said, no, I don't look at those things. I look at the heart. There's somebody out there and he may be little now and he may be ready, but I've seen his heart and his heart's after God and he's the one. That's what matters is the heart. Take off all the coverings. Take off the fact that he's been out with the sheep and he smells and he's the youngest and all those things, all those coverings because they had a covering back then. If you weren't the oldest, the oldest was the one with the blessing and what they lived under. And God said, I don't care what your covering is. I look at the heart. I look underneath all of the stuff that you put on top of it. And it's the same with us. God doesn't care what anybody else has put on top of you. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what somebody said about you. He doesn't care what your culture has taught you. He doesn't care about what religion has taught you. All of those things. He's provided the freedom to walk about in his kingdom and partake of everything he ever partook of on this earth. There's nothing that you have to experience that Christ didn't experience. And there's nothing that Christ experienced that you can't experience. So if he didn't experience sickness and disease, we don't have to experience either. And if he could partake of healing, and if he could partake of blessing, you know, um, I've said this before, anything, he had no lack because anything he needed he created. Amen. That's it. So uh, um, lack can't cover you if you can just create what you need. Right. If you, it, it, it can't cover you. In the, in the kingdom, you speak what you need and you have it. In the kingdom, there's no sickness, but there's also, there's no meal barrels going to dry in the kingdom doesn't exist. In this city, the mill barrel cannot run dry. How can it run dry when you have a tree planted in your city that bears fruit 12 months out of the year? Amen. It can't. It's not possible. Well, why do I see it? Because you believe it's possible. That's it. See, sometimes, especially with us, we've learned a lot, but sometimes we kind of want to jump in the kingdom and then jump back out right. and say... Based on our experience, based on what we see, if things are going great that day, then I must be great with the Lord. I'm walking in the kingdom. This is paradise. But if we see something go wrong, all of a sudden we think we've been kicked out of the garden. All of a sudden we think we don't have it anymore. All of a sudden we start looking for a reason. And that's the worst thing you can do is look for a reason. And that's what we all try to do is look for a reason. A reason for it to be the way it is. And the reason it's the worst thing you can do is because as soon as you find a reason for it to exist in your life, you've just given it the power to stay there. And like I said before, God said, I'm one God. And he said, you shall have no other gods before me. If a doctor's report declares your situation, then there's another God before him. You just put their word above his. If your bank account declares what your situation, then there's another God before you. Right. You just put what you see in that bank account above him. Yeah. You just say, well, the money's not there, so it can't be there. Well, that we, we see all throughout the Bible, that's not true. That's right, amen. So many times he came in, and without money, oh. and without even somebody to go give it to them, he just produced it out of nothing. Yeah. Because that's what he does. He creates. He doesn't need to have something there to create it. He can just make it just like that. Right. But we let... What we see dictate where we are and who we are and what we have to experience. And it's the exact opposite. It's what you don't see that dictates it. It's that kingdom that you can't see that didn't come with observation, that didn't come with me, and it didn't come with drink. Instead, it came with righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Instead, it came within you. Well, why did it have to come within me instead of outside of me? Isn't that what our flesh does? Wouldn't we like it just all just to be right there in front of us right now? Without it having to come inside of us first? <laughs> because if you do, you've come to Mount Sinai. What was wrong with Mount Sinai? They came, and there was thundering, and there was flashing, and there was a voice, and there was trumpets, and there was all these things. 
And you would think if we saw, we would think if we saw voices and thunders and lightning and fire, we'd know God was here. They knew God was there all right, and it scared them to death. Because nothing had changed on the inside of them. So on the inside, they still felt worthless. They still felt like sinners. They still felt all this baggage they kept carried from Egypt. So what they had on the outside didn't change the inside. That's why when they came, we talked about last week, they came to the land of Canaan, and they didn't enter in. Why didn't they enter in? Unbelief. Was it because God hadn't showed them miraculous signs? He showed them signs that I have never seen to this day. He parted a sea in front of them. He made manna fall on the ground. I've never walked outside and seen manna fall on the ground. He made water shoot out, or water shoot out of a rock. I've never seen water shoot out of a rock because somebody spoke to it, because somebody hit it. But what was the problem? They weren't changed on the inside. Everything can change around you on the outside, but if it don't change on the inside, it don't matter. You'll still keep manifesting what you believe on the inside. It'll still manifest. What you tr- Why? Because we're made in the image of God, and He's a creator. And that's a wonderful thing as long as you have the mind of Christ. But when you don't have the mind of Christ and you start looking around out here for something, you'll start creating crazy things, yeah. lies that have been told to you, and you'll see it manifest even though you don't want it there. That's why you, you ever see those shows where people win the lottery and they lose it all in a year or two. Why? Because on the inside they were always still poor. It didn't matter that they got all this money. Their mentality was still, you know, if you're poor, mentality, not in the natural, but if your mentality is, and I will put my hand up there, because when Dwayne and I first got married, we didn't have a whole lot. And the Lord has blessed us since then. But I found there's two things you do if you still keep that mentality. One, you'll be like me. You won't want to spend any of it because you're afraid it won't be there next time you need it. And you'll hoard it up. And all that happens, you know, at least I found, all that happens is you wind up being like they were in the Bible when the prophets say you'll be sticking food into your pockets and it'll be like it just falls out through holes. That's all that happens. You save it because you and you don't use it on something you really want to do because you think, I may not have this later, and then your refrigerator breaks down and you have to go spend it anyways. Amen. <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll save it and you'll think, I'm not going to spend this. I finally got some money and I'm putting it in the savings account and your tire blows in your car and you've got to go change the tire. And then the other thing that the other people do is they get it, if you have a poor mentality, is you get it and you're so scared you're not going to have any more, you go out and spend it off. Because you're scared you're not going to get to do that again. And if I got it now, I better go buy five cars right now, even though if there's no way I can drive five cars right now at one time. Because I may not have it later. So since I got so, either way, you wind up losing. Why? Because your mentality is still a lack mentality. And that lack manifests. It don't matter how it manifests, it still keeps manifesting. Same thing with sickness and disease. If your disease is if you have a sickness and disease mentality, you can be miraculously healed. Have you ever seen someone just, a prophet of God comes in and through his faith, not theirs, through his faith, he raises them up and gets them healed. But then a year later, you see them, they're sick again. Because the mentality didn't change. That's true. Right. true. That's why um, I believe it was Or Roberts would make them come and listen to him speak before he prayed for them. Because he knew if, if, if your mentality doesn't change, I can pray just my faith can get you healed, but then you'll be right back in the same That's mess right. with something else, and it won't matter. Right. You have to get, change the mentality. You have to put on the mind of Christ. Yes. Yeah. That's why sinners can get healed, and that's wonderful. And then still go out and do, live the same crazy life they lived before. Even though God showed them something great. Why? Because their mentality hasn't changed yet. This hasn't changed yet. Now, we're, we know the days come when it will. That's right. We know the days come when... Um, Every, everyone will see eye to eye and Zion. And we thank God for that day. But I'm tired of just waiting on a day. Amen. I'm ready to start living in a day. Uh, I'm ready to start walking in a day. I'm tired of just waiting on a kingdom that's sitting right here. Yeah. I'm tired of sitting in a piece of the kingdom and not walking out the whole thing. Amen. I'm tired of believing for my bills to be paid, but I can't help somebody else pay theirs. I want the full thing. Amen. I want it all. Why? Because I can have it all. Yeah. That's right. And that's not greedy. I don't want it all to forge it up for myself. I don't want just me, my four, saved and no more. And the rest of the rest of them can go to hell. I don't care, which is what a lot of people say. I don't want just me and my family blessed. And if somebody else messed up with their money, oh well, that's their problem. They should have thought better of it. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to just 
bless this church, we want to go to nations and bless yeah. the nations. Yeah. It's not just about us. But you can't bless them if you're not blessed. Um, and I don't mean just blessed on the outside. I mean blessed on the inside. Because yeah, right. like I said, this city is an inward thing. It works its way from the inside out. Yeah. It doesn't come from the outside in. It works its way from the inside out. It's an invisible city, but yet it's the invisible things that are permanent and it's the visible things that pass yeah. away. So that's what we want to partake of. Um, it talks about in here, it said, you know, that he's coming again and he's going to shake everything. And this time he's not just going to shake the earth. On Mount Sinai, he shook the earth. But it said this time he was going to shake everything, including the heavens and the earth. And we always told that that was some way far off. And we were also always told it was a pretty scary thing. Scary. Yeah. scary. I mean, Matt talks about, we, we, we watched some movies that I wouldn't let my kids watch. I mean, because that was their way of getting you born again was to scare the mess out of you. That was what they, they did. So we watched some movies, read some books, went to some plays that I wouldn't send my children to now because I know better now and because I wouldn't want them to come home with nightmares now. I mean, it was just crazy the kind of things that they used to try to get people to come to God. And that's not what he said. He said it's the goodness of God that draws them. Amen. He said, he said, except the Holy Spirit draws them anyways, how would they ever come? You know, um, there's when I was in college, there was, we were having a conversation about tattoos, right or wrong. And uh, I, I could care less if you have one or not. But this boy said, well, I think that, you know, some guy he knew got tattoos, and I think it was scriptures and pictures of Jesus, and it was to be a witness. And I said, well, you know, if he wants to get that, that's his, that's his decision. But if you think that's going to draw men to Christ, it won't. Because that's not what the Word says. It says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. It says the Holy Spirit has to draw them. So don't use that as his excuse. I mean, if you want one, go get one, but don't use that as your excuse, that it's just to witness. It's the same thing as walking around and knocking on people's door and handing out tracts. Well, if you want to do it, have at it. But I tell you, half the people are going to wish you never would have knocked on the door. Because unless the Spirit draws them, you just show them up at their door. Not to mention the fact that you can have 20 things going on and they still won't leave. <laughs> you can open the door with babies crying and dogs barking and you're half-dressed and they still want to talk to you and you're going, not now, now's not the time. <laughs> but they still want to talk to you. All you're doing is just working the flesh again. It's just the work of the flesh. And it's never going to be that way. This kingdom doesn't come with observation. It's not going to come with something that you see. But that's a wonderful thing, because I tell you, if you change on the inside, nothing can stop the outside from changing. That's right, amen. Not one circumstance, not anything that you do. You know, when Abraham got convinced that he was Abraham and not Abram, when he got convinced that he was the father of many nations, he started producing. But the great thing was, he finally got, and Sarah got, convinced that she was also a princess, of going to be mother to this. And then he produced the right thing. Sometimes we know we're producers, but we produce the wrong thing because we try to do it ourselves. Right. Try to manifest it ourselves. Yeah. If you ever meet people, they're going to bring in the kingdom of God, bless God. They're going to do it themselves. Except for, yes, all it is, it's themselves. They didn't hear from God. They didn't wait wait on God and hear from Him and get a revelation. Or if they did, you know, I love what um, George Warnock says. They have a vision, they have a dream, and it really did come from God. Then they try to make it happen. And that's why you see it get so messed up. He said, how do you see these great revivals that were wonderful and really were moves of God just plummet and go down the tubes? Because they got in the way and they tried to make it come to pass. Instead of just letting the Lord take care of it and letting the Lord dictate it. You know, the Lord can make it break out from your church to the city all the way out to the nations without you ever having to try to figure out how to do anything. Yeah, right. Amen. Or if he so wants, he can make it break out from your church to the nations, back to your country, back to your city. That's true. He can do it however he wants. Hallelujah. It doesn't have, we, have, we have a formula. I remember when I went, and it was one of my least favorite classes. When I went to college, I minored in missions, and we had to go to a church growth or building, something like that. I don't even remember the name of it. But it was basically a step-by-step -step process about how you grow your church. That's what it was. And I knew enough, even then, from staying here underneath the pastor, uh, underneath, that was when Papa was pastor, 
underneath him to know that if the Lord doesn't do the work, I don't care how big it looks, it'll either A, eventually fall, or B, it'll just be a social club, and anybody can build one of those. That's right. And that's pretty much what they were giving you the steps to build. I mean, they weren't giving you steps, go out and do miracles, go out and do this. No, it was, well, you know, if people don't like pews, switch to theater chairs. Which I don't care if you have a theater chair as long as you're not just laying back and going to sleep in it. But, you know, that was how you grew your church. If, if, if people aren't coming, then have, you know, a movie night with popcorn and get people to come. You know, and there's nothing wrong with movies and popcorn. It's just that it won't change you. And if you're sick and in the hospital, movies and popcorn ain't going to raise you up. So you have to have something more. And most people that have that don't have anything more. If you haven't been around, and I've been to other states and other places and been to churches, and I've been to different kinds of churches because that was one thing that we were required to do for that class was to go and check out other kinds of churches. I've been all the way from those that believe that they're so free and contemporary that they don't have to do hardly anything like we think church should be done, all the way to those that are in so much bondage that they have to do everything the way they did it a thousand years ago. And let me tell you, it's bondage no matter which side of you flock to. It's bondage over here having to um, we went to this one church and you know the prayer was the pastor talking to you and you answer back and it was a prescribed prayer. That's what it was. And that was your prayer for the day. I mean there you know that was all you were going to get out of it for that day for that service. Then I went to another one they're so free they can do whatever they want except for if you go there and you don't look like them and you don't act like them, then you're not really free. Oh, yeah. And that's bondage, no matter which way you put it. If you are bound to jeans and a t-shirt or you're bound to a suit and a tie, you're still in bondage. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't matter how you want to cut it and slice it, it's still bondage. Right. If you're bound to sing it from a song book or if you're bound to sing in every contemporary song that you can find because you wouldn't want to look at a song book, you're still bound. That's right. It's still bondage. It's still not flowing by the Spirit. It's still not kingdom. It's still not living in the city. I don't care which side, you know, Brother Hayden said we all try to get on one side of the ditch or the other. And nobody just wants to go down the middle road. And the middle road is the Jesus way. I don't have another way for you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. You're not going to find some other way in or out of this kingdom. It's just Jesus all the time. Well, what's the, what's the rules of the kingdom, Jesus? What's the commands of the kingdom, Jesus? What's the answer to the kingdom, Jesus? You're not going to find another way. How do I get healed, Jesus? How do I get blessed, Jesus? How do I help my marriage, Jesus? There just isn't another way. Now, he may tell you something to do, and he may not. You know, the other I remember uh, a couple weeks ago, I had a situation, and it upset me. And I don't mean like it just made me mad. I mean, I was upset, emotionally upset. And I went and did what, you know, the song says. Had a little, little talk with Jesus. Told him all about my troubles. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if you're going to have to tell somebody all about your troubles, he's the one you want to go tell it to. Now, don't go tell it to your neighbor. That's don't right. go tell it to your girlfriend. Not even your mama or your daddy, because everybody's going to have their opinion. And I can tell you, their opinion's nothing. My opinion's nothing. I don't even want to hear my own opinion sometimes. Sometimes I'll think something and I'll go, wait a minute, that's just me. That's not God. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's just my opinion and me getting in the way of me. So I went and, you know, told Jesus all about it. Cried. Had all the, all the good stuff. And the, But the good news is I've learned enough to listen. So when I went to bed that night, all it took was, was one little sentence, and it was over. And he wow. just said, well, who told you you were naked? Yeah. Who told you that any of this could somehow afford harm affect your life anyways to begin with? Who told you any of this? Who told you your life could be anything but what the kingdom of God is? Who told you that? Somebody in the world? Your own crazy brain? What happened to your friend? What you saw on TV? You know, you sit around and you watch Dr. Phil and all these marriages fall apart and then you start looking at your husband thinking, you know what? He doesn't fulfill my needs. You know what? He doesn't come home and do this for me. He doesn't do that for me. Because we listen to all that craziness. We just listen to it. We feed ourselves on it. 
We just feed ourselves on it. And it's not that I'm against any person or any show. I'm against you feeding that and believing that that's your life experience. I'm not against you watching a show or watching a movie. Just don't take it on as your experience. Don't take it on as something that you have to go through. Don't take it on as dictating your life. Some people, if, you know, some doctor on TV says not to eat something, you better believe they're not going to eat it for the rest of their lives. Because they 100% believe everything they hear on TV. They believe it and they take it on. That, 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 that's their covering. That's what they hold to. But this is our covering. If you go and you read chapter 21 of Revelation, that's your covering. Right there. That's what you need to be under. You need to be living where there's no darkness because the Lamb is your light. You need to be living where there's no death. You need to be living where there's no sorrow. All that sorrow I was experiencing and taking on is mine. It wasn't mine. The Lord never gave it to me. It wasn't mine to take on. I just took it on. You know, I thought about the scapegoat. And I thought about when I first heard a part, and I will say a part because it was not the full thing, but when I was in college, some of my professors knew a little bit about the kingdom message. But their message was kind of like this. The kingdom is an already not yet thing. Yes, it came with Jesus, but we don't see the fulfillment of it. So it was a half and half, you know, mixture. They're like the way to see in church. Mixture, mixture. Back and forth. Yes, it came. Jesus was great, but now we have to live down here again until it comes back again. And that was how they lived. And um, when I first heard it, I remember thinking, how can I say that to somebody and tell them that Jesus defeated the devil when they're going through all these horrible things in their life? Because that was the thing. We had to have a scapegoat. We had to have somebody to blame it on. That's what we needed. But you know, when the children of Israel had the scapegoat offered, it wasn't about blaming it on somebody. And we're actually looking at the wrong thing to blame it on. Because Jesus became our scapegoat. Yes. If you look at Jesus as your scapegoat, he took it all and he took it outside the gate. Outside the city. Nailed it to the cross and it was over. Yes. So don't set it up inside your city, in the middle of the city, and just keep looking at it every day. Don't set all your sorrows up there. Don't set all your pain up there and just look at it every day and expect it to somehow go away. Leave it outside the gate. All that stuff that's trying to enter your city that has no right to be there, that has nothing to do with the New Jerusalem, let it go outside the gate. Let it go. Because it's not a part of you. It's just a covering that somebody or something tried to put on you is not a part of you. You have a great city, a great wall, a great foundation, and you don't have to partake of that. And I just want to encourage you this morning, anything that looks, even sounds like it might not be kingdom, stick it outside the gate. Yeah. Let it go. Now, I promise you nothing's going to happen because you're not naked. You're covered with the glory of God. Yeah. You're a citizen of His kingdom and it, it, nothing is going to happen to you. Anything that's screaming at you right now that it has power to hurt you somehow, it has none. Yeah. Behold, Israel your God is one God. Yeah. That's it. It's that one God and He controls it all. He's master of it all. Nothing that's screaming that it can hurt you right now actually has any power to hurt you. You have every right to kick it out the gate until it doesn't belong. Hallelujah. God bless you.